All right, Melanie, you want to call us to order and all that good stuff? You got it. All right, so we're missing uh, Barb Franco. Skip Kieser. Uh, Skip's here. He's muted. Muted, but here. Yes. Here. Richard Beck. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank Kevin you. Brooks. Present. Jill Barwick. I saw her a second ago. I see her raising her hand. Scott Warren. Here. Gary Woodruff. He's here. Ronald Sartori. Here. Thank you. Greg Chaponi. Close enough. Good enough. Ah. I would like, could you tell me how you pronounce your name so I can make sure I get it right? Um, Chaponi's fine. Chaponi would be better. Either. Chaponi. Got it. Uh, Mike Pearson. Present. Physically or mentally, Mike? Both today, Dr. Brooks. Thank you. Kelly Jurgensen. Here. Thank you. Um, I'm present, Melanie Griffiths. Carlos Villafuerte. I'm here. Jordan Michaels. Here. Dr. Massetti. Here. Thank you. Um, missing as of right now, and I'll check to make sure we don't have anybody waiting in our panel swing, is Jason Gramlich, Steve Duff, and Barb Franco. Looks like we have a quorum. Excellent. OK, uh, apologies to all in advance. I am uh, reporting to you all from the Denver airport. So apologies if there's background noise or if security hauls me off. Um, with that, I um, thought we would um, go around and have our current members introduce ourselves. And then we'd like to have our newest members also introduce themselves. Um, and for our new members, um, maybe one fun fact about yourselves. Um, and for our existing members, also one fun fact. And for our new members, uh, what was the impetus for you to uh, volunteer uh, to be a Measure H uh, CBOC member? So with that, I will go first. Um, so I'm Kevin Brooks. Uh, fun fact, I uh, do renovation projects for a living. I work for a general contractor doing healthcare construction. And I also uh, finally, after five years, finished uh, a renovation project on my, on my house. And we are still married. Miracles do happen. Uh, so Richard, I'm gonna pick on you and hand it to you next. Okay, okay. you want me to be sideways or you just want me just to talk? You know, Richard, you're sideways every day. So however you'd like to do it is right, fine. There I am, I'm sideways, guys. Uh, my name is Richard Beck. I've been on the uh, this committee for the last, uh, it'll, it'll end in November, it'll be six years. I was on a Major M committee, oversight committee for four years before that uh, at, the, at the Major M. Uh, I'm uh, uh, almost retired. I'm a general contractor, been that way for 40 years. I, uh, uh, fun facts, I guess that's the fun facts about that. Um, and like Kevin, I, I remodel houses, but people like him not, and myself as well. But that's what I did. I did remodeling for years. And, uh, and I don't know why I'm sideways. Who are you going to hand it off to? Richard, who are you going to hand it off to? I don't know, Skip, you want to talk? I am going to stop my video, though. Uh, Skip Kaiser, a uh, retired engineer. Uh, Served on uh, Measure M, Measure N for the college, and now Measure H. I guess I'm a slow learner. <laughs> well, All right, Skip. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you hand it off to somebody, Skip? Um, who we got here? That's there. Jill's there. Uh, Jill and Scott. Go for it. 
Uh, just a just a heads up, Jill just emailed me and told me that her microphone is not working. Um, so she says hello, but she can hear us. Um, and Jill, if you, it, um, I just, I would feel free to use the chat um, if you have something that comes up and, and we'll keep an eye on the chat in case you need to ask a question or anything during the meeting. I'll also keep an eye on my email for you. Scott, why don't you go? I guess that's me. Uh, Scott Warren, um, in addition to Measure H, it was also on, uh, I believe it was Measure G, wasn't it back then? Uh, the other school bond issue. Um, fun fact, in addition to my um, daytime job, I also played drums in a rock band. <laughs> I think I had forgotten that. So good for that we're doing this. Can you, can you hear? Which, which, by the way, if you're a drummer in a rock band, you need to have a full-time job. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. I think that's all of our existing members. Uh, Gary, I'm going to pick on you next. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Gary Woodruff. I'm recently retired, uh, but I worked about 27 years for Sutter Health as a clinical architect and infrastructure architect within IT services many different hospitals built through the years, that kind of stuff. Um, I've always been interested in giving back to the community. And uh, my, my ex-wife was a, a teacher, so I was involved indirectly with the school district for many, many, many years. Uh, so that's why I'm here. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, who is next? I'll go. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm. My name's Ron Sartori, and um, I don't know how fun this fact is, but uh, my wife and I are retired, and uh, I had spent almost uh, 40 years in the semiconductor business down in San Jose, and we moved to Napa in 2018, and we absolutely love it here, and uh, I think that um, most Napans don't appreciate how how good we have it up here. Um, the reason I joined, uh, volunteered, was my daughters um, had been the beneficiaries of being in a, in a wonderful school district in Cupertino. And um, I wanted in uh, some small way to uh, contribute here in Napa. Excuse me, thank you for that. Sorry for the background noise. Uh, who would like to go next? Greg. Sure. Um, Greg Spony, retired high school teacher. Fun facts. Hmm. Boy, lost for lost for a thought. But if you've ever been to Farmer's Market, I volunteered, my wife and I volunteered there every Tuesday morning and for several years volunteered on Saturdays also. And my daughter, oldest daughter is getting married next month and I can't keep track of anything right now. <laughs> we just had Steve Duff join us. All right, welcome, Steve. We are uh, just going around and doing introductions. So um, if you would be uh, kind enough to just um, introduce yourself, uh, tell us a fun fact about yourself and why you volunteered for Measure H. That'd be awesome. Muted, he's, he's muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Hi, I'm Steve Duff. Um, I am retired at this point in my career. Uh, I did put in about 30 or 40 years as a senior financial analyst and budget director for hospitals, most recently for St. Helena Hospital. And uh, my interest in doing this is just community service. I previously served five years on the board of Napa Valley Education Foundation and was on their board for five years. It gave me a lot of exposure to the school system. 
So this seemed like a natural for me. So I'm looking forward to uh, making some, any contributions that I can. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. And welcome to our four new members. And uh, those of us that are terming out in November and particularly Mr. Pearson, I'm sure are very appreciative of, um, of you guys uh, taking up the call and volunteering for this. Um, on the um, drive, which everyone should have been invited to, there's um, some basic uh, CBOC 101 onboarding information, which you should all have access to. Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, either Melanie or Kelly can help you out with that. I'll, I'll go ahead and show it real quick, Kevin. Okay. Can you, you guys uh, see in the website right now? Just double checking. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so if you go down here and you go to Measure H, and then you go here to the Bond Oversight Committee, um, this is your uh, committee's webpage, lots of resources and information. Um, but specifically, if you go, this is where your Zoom link is going to be. And then if you go here, you're going to get all your meeting documents. If you click here, you're going to see our meeting schedule. So there's our schedule for now. And then if you click here, you're going to see documents. You're going to see past meetings, annual reports, audits, and then also folders by date for um, the meetings uh, that are more recent. So if you have any questions, let me know. I know that two members today were having some issues accessing this Google um, folder, which is supposed to be public for everyone. There should be no invite or limitations. Um, I spoke with uh, Mr. Michaels, who's on this call. He's the director of IT. Um, and he is happy to have anybody that come by the um, IT office at the district go to the help desk with your computer and um, one of the staff there can help you if you're having an issue. Um, so that's probably the best way to resolve it at this point um, is for somebody to look at the computer. Maybe you need to run an update or something like that, but I think they're happy to help, right, Jordan? Yes, absolutely, happy to help. Um, our hours are, are from 7.30 to four um, and uh, you can always send me an email. Uh, specific help as well so, uh, at jmichaelsnbusd.org. Kelly, the only thing that was coming up today when I clicked it was uh, the meeting dates. The, the, the meeting, this information was not there, just the meeting dates on either. Yeah, day. yeah and um, as Steve was also having an issue as well. Um, so I um, called Jordan right away when I realized both of you were having the same issue. Nobody else could recreate that issue. So we're not exactly sure what's going on, um, but we're happy to have you guys come by the help desk with your computer and somebody can give you a hand figuring it out because it is a completely public um, Google Drive. Everyone should be able to access it. How do you figure this out? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they can help you with that while, we're, while they're looking at your, your access. So anyway, that is just a quick rundown of your um, resources here at the website. If you have any questions about what you're looking at here, feel free to give us a call or drop us an email, um, but wanted to give you a quick look at that. All right. Kevin, you're on mute. Okay, that's five dollars. All right, so lots on the docket today. Kelly, thanks for that. Uh, before us is the agenda. Um, so uh, item number three on the agenda is the acceptance of the agenda for today's meeting. Um, do we have a motion to accept today's agenda? Kevin, we were, Kelly and I were wondering if there's a few things we could uh, just reorder um, in the light that I have to leave at six, um, just to double check in, in the event that it is running a little longer. Um, Kelly, do you want to go, go over the, what we discussed? Yes, absolutely. And I'm also going to ask that if you are not currently on mute, if you could mute yourself, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. There's a lot of background noise. I think it's just multiple microphones on. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so what we were hoping to do is um, item 10, future agenda items. We have a couple of things that we want to go over with the committee um, regarding how we address specific comments moving forward and planning for our next meeting, which will be at uh, Napa Junction, and it'll be in person. Right. 
So we are hoping to move that up in the agenda if we could possibly do that um, after inform the public. Um, that would help things out tremendously in case uh, Mike has to jump off to the next meeting. So if that's acceptable to the committee, we'd ask for that amendment. All right, so motion to accept the agenda with item 10 being behind item number five. Mm -hmm. Do we have a motion? I motion it, Gary. Do we have a, okay, thank you, Gary. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Scott? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We have unanimity in the acceptance of the agenda. Item number four on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the March 9th meeting. Um, so Kelly, if you could pull up those minutes, please. Absolutely. Give me just one second here. <clears throat> Got too many windows open and I lost the meeting minutes. Bear with me for just a second. That, you know, that's a function of being too prepared. <laughs> I hope so. I'll take it. I have so many windows open. I was having trouble finding them. There they are. All right. So here are the meeting minutes from the last meeting. Um, they were also included in your packet online, but feel free to let us know if there's anything you see or would like to comment on. Kelly, you can uh, scroll down, please. So section six or item six, right? We reviewed, we reviewed the audit report. And then we reviewed the annual report. Um, annual report was presented last Thursday. Thank you, Mr. Pearson and uh, Superintendent Massetti for uh, allowing me to do that on Thursday and not Friday morning. Much appreciated. <laughs> you did a great job and I'm so happy it was at a reasonable time. Yeah, that's it. Um, we also did a, a very, actually, we skipped over project updates. Um, and we ran through everything else because we were, we were crunched for time. Any comments on the agenda, I mean, on the minutes from the March 9th meeting, any, anybody? No. no. Okay. All right, with that, uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from our March 9th meeting? Yeah, I'll approve it. I, um, me, Kevin, even though you can't see me. I, you know, Richard, you, you know, your, your voice is all we need to hear. Okay, so uh, do, we, do we have a second? Oh, second. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Skip. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, unanimous approval of the minutes, thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is uh, communication with the public. And do we have any, um, or in informing the public, do we have any uh, members of the public present? At this time, we have no uh, other attendees in this meeting. Okay. Again, sorry for the background noise. Kevin, I, I do have something to tell all the new members though. You'll notice it says 60 minutes up there on, in parentheses. Generally speaking, somebody puts these numbers up there, how long these things are supposed to take. It's not always true because this is certainly not gonna take 60 minutes. It actually is, Richard, because there's two slides today, and that's why we oh. have our special guest, Dr. Massetti, here. Oh, so um, she's going to share some information that she has been informing the public on in oh. the next slide. Oh, okay. I got you. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. But that's what, but that's what the, the numbers are. The Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and, and we will, so uh, we will forego with the uh, uh, repeating of 5A as we don't have any members of the public present. And we will move on to uh, Dr. Musetti and Mr. Pearson. Yep. And I will yeah, mute myself. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for that. So um, while we bring this up to share with everybody before uh, Dr. Mercedi gets into it, um, what we wanted to do was to give, just make sure everybody is, is aware of this. And I think as CDOC members, you, you are aware of it, but um, school districts up and down the state of California do not get facility money from the state of California to do any kind of work on the facilities, any major work on, on their facilities. Um, typically, it's left up to the, the, the taxpayers uh, that comprise the, uh, the school districts, regions uh, to come to approve voter approved bonds uh, to help us maintain our facilities and or build new facilities um, as needed. I, and uh, again, I, I'm pretty sure uh, all you are obviously aware of that. So hey Mike, Mike, could I just stop you real quick? Do you know the, the percentages? There's a, there's a percentage, right, that you can take from OPEX and there's specific things that you may spend it on and specific things that you may not spend it on? Of the, you mean of the voter approved bonds, Kevin? No, of the, of your, of the district's annual budget, right? Yeah, so that's spelled out, yeah, it's 3% of the, of the annual budget uh, is, is goes towards uh, the, the maintenance of, of your school district. But the, the, the kind of the, the tension to that, is, uh, Kevin and everybody, is that it's not, it, that, that, that 3 percent is actually all of the budget. So it incorporates also salaries of all of our employees um, and just our general uh, expenses that we need to do to keep the district up and running. So when it's all said and done, um, when we look at our budget, when we take our, our budgets and we're going to take it, you know, and see what we have to do, as you described, OPEX or do a project it's somewhere in the neighborhood, depending upon the year, depending upon fiscal uh, inflation, depending upon rising energy prices, uh, roughly between two to four hundred thousand dollars after it's all said and done with that. So, as you can see, that that's not a very big dollar amount to help us maintain uh, to do any kind of significant improvements on, on our school district. So we're we have to resort then to re resort to then looking at the, the possibility of, of voter approved uh, bonds. And so we're going to share with you the data that recently we did a, a bond polling a study with using True North. We're going to, uh, Dr. Mercedes is going to go through the, the results that came through uh, uh, recently done in February um, as, as our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. We feel it's important that you know um, what, what, the, what the survey said. And we did something unique in this one. Um, in, in past uh, bond uh, feasibility studies that were done or, or surveys that were done, it was always looked at as it, it, just as using the entire district as, as surveying this one. But we looked, we were aware of uh, what now is what we call school facilities improvement districts, um, where if you're a district that has two, minis two, or, uh, two or more municipalities, you can actually split the bonds up and have one bond for one municipality and one bond for another municipality. And because Napa Valley Unified is comprised of Napa and American Canyon, as well as Yountville, but we're focusing on American Canyon and Napa. Uh, that was one of the key uh, parts of this new survey that we wanted to get some data on. And then we're, and obviously we're gonna share that with you right now. So Dr. Mercedi, if you wanna take it away. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for your introduction. And thank you CBOC members for all of your service and your time, we're so grateful. And thanks for providing me the opportunity to share this data with you. So like Mike said, um, we, um, you know, just as a California superintendent, um, it's really important, I think, to continuously assess your um, support um, in the community uh, for or against bonds, uh, given what he shared, right? California public school systems do not receive a dedicated revenue, ongoing revenue stream to do massive capital improvements in their district. So um, Mike recently uh, completed an assessment. We know uh, at what every building in the district needs and despite the generosity of past um, bond measures, the generosity of voters during past bond measures, you know, maintaining all of these buildings and keeping them, um, you know, of, of uh, strong uh, quality for our students and our staff that that you know run education in the buildings every day is really really important and really really expensive. So we have about five hundred million dollars in need. Um, the way the state of California expects a California superintendent, a district leadership team, a school board to really solve the issue since they don't fund it at, at the state level um, is, is they say you solve it at the local level through local tax measures, right? And so thankfully we've been able to pass four bonds and accomplish a lot of things. Many of the people on this call are very tuned into what measure H has been able to accomplish 
four new schools, modernization of several schools, state-of-the-art technology for every school, every student teacher in the district, um, you know, a central kitchen to be able to run uh, an incredible um, healthy food services program for our kids. So lots of great things were accomplished, um, but there's still $500 million in need. And without the state moving forward, some massive capital improvement funding mechanism, you know, we've got to figure out how we can continue to um, gain support for bonds until California school funding changes to address your facility issues. So um, uh, as the new superintendent here four years ago, I was well aware that support for bonds um, were, were, wasn't great, right? Measure H passed, but it barely passed. So I'm very clear that there's tax sensitivity in the Valley. Um, and I also know that there's been um, questions of mistrust when it comes to bond programs in the district, right? But nonetheless, in my role, I can't just throw my hands up in the air around the sensitivity and the mistrust. I have to work on that. I have to work to improve that. Because if I throw my hands up in the air, then I'm, I'm not um, working in service to the kids because I'm aware of the fact that there's no funding stream from the state to do large scale capital improvements. But I know that our schools need it, which means that our kids need it. So um, in doing due diligence as, as a superintendent, um, you fast forward to 2020, after two years of being here, uh, um, at that point in 2020, four years after um, Measure H had passed, we, I, I went ahead and, and had a research firm, hired a research firm. You actually see their name in the left-hand corner, True North, and um, conducted a poll to see what was the, the sentiment about bonds in the community back then. I'll tell you about the results of that poll momentarily, but then fast forward two years after that, um, the, the polling wasn't favorable back, back in 2020. We recently decided to poll again, and we polled differently than we did in 2020 because I'd been here four years. I know the place a lot better. And we were trying to think of a strategy that would improve our results potentially. And the strategy that surfaced for us that we wanted to test with voters in the poll was the strategy that Mike mentioned. It's a known strategy in many counties in California, never been done in Napa County, but it has happened. 13 counties in the state of California have used it. Um, it's been happening since the uh, mid nineties as a strategy where school districts that are unified, stay unified, completely stay unified in terms of their budget, their schools, et cetera, their board, et cetera, et cetera. But they do split the district for the purposes of bond measures. They split the districts into school facilities improvement districts, very common in districts with many cities in their unified that cover large geographic areas, why? because it's very common sentiment. The taxpayer says, I live in this city. And if I pass a school bond that can go to all the cities in the unified school district, what guarantee do I have that the schools in my city are going to get touched by those bond dollars? How do, how do I ensure that, the, that the, the revenue generated by the bonds don't go you know, four cities down the, down the way? where I don't see the schools, my kids don't attend the schools, they're not schools in my community. So given that Napa has, we, you know, we have a large geographic area that we cover. It is three cities. Yonville no longer is in the mix in terms of having a school because we closed it. But you know, we do have the two entities, the two cities of, of um, American Canyon and Napa, and the needs are so different. The needs are so different that we thought it would be interesting in this poll to not only measure general support for future school bond, but also to see the viability of this strategy. What did the vote, what does a voter think about this strategy? Does it increase the support at, at all? So I'm happy to share the results with you today around SFID bond feasibility, school facility improvement district. Next slide. So I think I laid out the purpose of the study, but the poll was to, to do what I just said. It also helps us gather information around um, what are the, the priorities in the community if they were to pass a bond, what are, what are the priorities in terms of investments they'd like to see the school district make with the dollars. It also gives us information on communication and outreach efforts. You'll see there's data there around different arguments and we assess what arguments resonate with the, with the voter. 
positive arguments in favor of bond, negative arguments um, not in favor of a bond. So all of this data gathering is, is data to inform our decision making. Next slide. So the methodology of the poll, uh, it was conducted the first two weeks of February. Um, and it was a random sample of 834 likely uh, November 2022 voters, right? We have the voter demographic data on folks in, in, in both cities. Um, it was 606 in the Napa SFID. So we spoke to 606 voters in the city of Napa and the, as the, includes the, un, the surrounding unincorporated areas of Napa. And then 228 voters in the American Canyon SFID. It was a mixed method approach. Some folks got recruited via an email. Um, some got um, uh, um, recruited via a text. And some got a phone call, a, a live phone call with a person. So the data collection either happened via the phone or an online survey that, that someone um, accessed via an email or text message. On average, the interview would take about 17 minutes, right, to answer all of the questions. And it was um, delivered in English and Spanish dependent upon the voters identified primary language of preference. There is a margin of error in the data. So when you have a sample size of 606 in Napa, you need to look at the data with a plus or minus 4.4% four percentage points margin of error. And for American Canyon, smaller statistical sample size, the margin of error is plus or minus 6.4%. Next slide, Kelly. So the first thing that we ask the voter is we, 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 we hit them with these important voter issues that you see listed on the left-hand side. And we ask them to kind of rank them in, 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 um, uh, in, in terms of level of importance uh, to you as a voter. The good news, I'm gonna show you uh, Napa data and then American Canyon data. So in Napa, 84% um, ranked uh, improving the quality of education in local public schools as the most important issue. That's great news. If you look halfway down the list, in the middle there, it says the issue of repairing and upgrading aging school facilities. That's less important to the voter. It only ranked 64%. But what, it, what, what that tells us is that we um, have to educate the voter on the connection between quality of public education and the, the, the impact, right, uh, the quality of the facilities can have on the public, on the educational experience of children, right? We want them in warm, safe, dry uh, facilities, and, and that improves their educational experience. Next slide. American Canyon also cares deeply about public, um, um, public education. They, they ranked it a little bit more. They cared a little bit more at 90%. So 90% ranked uh, quality of education as, as the top issue. You see the same disparity, right? That repairing and upgrading aging school facilities, less relevant, just tells us again, we've got to make the connection for the voter that the quality of the educational experience is impacted by, by, by the, the school facilities factor. Next slide. So the next thing we do, the, the next thing True North, that's the company that we hired, the research firm that we hired. Um, True North does is they just put out a ballot. Uh, they put out a, a, a sample ballot language. So we chose boilerplate ballot language, right? We only can put 75 words on the ballot. It's extremely limited. There's legal constraints around how we can frame the ballot language. And you see some of that, particularly in the bottom portion where it lays out how much the tax is going to cost. Much of that is dictated by law in, in terms of how we can say it. But you see the four bullets that we laid out there for the voter. And we just initially cold with no information, no education, no campaigning. We ask them, would you vote yes on this measure? And um, in, that was the, the language in Napa. Next slide, Kelly. The language in American Canyon was not very different. The only thing was that it removed one of the bullets. It doesn't include the bullet around the removal of asbestos and hazardous materials because that's not a, an issue in American Canyon. Why? The schools are newer. So it's only an issue in the schools of the city of Napa. We don't have that issue in the city of American Canyon schools given that they're newer. So drum roll, please. What happened uh, with the initial ballot test in Napa? So to pass a school bond, some of you probably know this sitting on the CVOC, it requires 55% of the vote. 
Um, and in Napa, just with that initial ballot uh, presentation, 55% said probably yes or definitely yes. Um, in American Canyon, oh, go past the slide and I'll, I'll explain. I don't, that, that's misplaced there. American Canyon, um, the, the, um, it was 56%. So both cities with no education, no background are right on the cusp of passing it. Um, what I want to report is that I told you at the beginning that we polled in 2020, right? Me doing the due diligence as superintendent, just ongoing assessment of where is the community at in terms of support for local bond measures to support school facilities. And back in 2020, if you scroll back to that other slide, Kelly, that, that was kind of out of place there. You'll see that um, the initial ballot test in, in back in 2020, it says 2019, so that's also an error. Please accept my apologies for that typo. The initial ballot test ranked at 47%. So fast forward two years later, we've made eight percentage points uh, of an increase with the initial ballot test. And we've made uh, not with uh, in Napa and in American Canyon, we've increased it to 56%. So from 47% in 2020 to 56% in, um, in 2022. Um, go ahead, Kelly. Um, just stay right there for a second. That, that's exciting news. Why is that particularly exciting? We had a lot of conversations with the research firm who do these polls up and down the state. And they told me that this was worth, this was noteworthy. I said, tell me more. Why is this noteworthy? It's, you know, it's only eight, nine percentage points. They said many school districts in the state of California polled in 2020. And then the pandemic happened. So they didn't put a bond measure on the 2020 ballot because of the crisis the world was living. Fast forward to 2022, many are reconsidering and assessing again. And he said that the norm was that, that he's been seeing in terms of the polls that he's been doing for school districts is that school districts have been sliding back 10 to 15 percentage points up and down the state. I said, tell me more about that, why? He said, well, school districts during the pandemic got a really bad rap. Many school districts were accused of not opening their doors early enough and staying closed most of the pandemic. That was not, our situation. We were one of the first uh, K through 12 districts in the state of California of our size to open um, our doors during the pandemic. But that was the norm in the rest of the state. Mo mo a lot of California schools stayed closed. And he said a lot of people are express have expressed their dissatisfaction with their school district because of the long term closure. And then issues like masking have been highly politicized and people have been sort of upset and they're, they're expressing their dissatisfaction. I said, um, okay, well, we can explain some of that. We opened, uh, we opened uh, earlier than everybody else. Um, the other kind of thing that we unpacked is the voter demographic in the city of Napa is a much older um, demographic, 65 and over. Uh, less than 5% are current parents in the schools. So the thought there is that um, that voter demographic tends to be more financially conservative and that the district has made a lot of tough financial decisions. There's been a full financial turnaround in NVUSD and that, um, that, that financial stewardship tends to resonate with the more mature older voter who tends to be more fiscally conservative. So that was kind of some of the unpacking that we did with the research firm as to why this increase at a time when the state is trending to have less support for school bonds and that, that's some of the reasoning we came up with. So the next question we ask, no, stay there, stay there. The next question we ask is, this is where we specifically ask the Napa voter, what if the dollars were to just stay in Napa and not go to any American Canyon schools? In Napa, it didn't move the needle. It stayed at 55%. Mike and I were pretty shocked by this. We thought that we've heard so much about um, this tension, right, between the dollars, you know, going here versus there. We thought it would move the needle. Again, we unpacked this with the research firm and some of the conclusions they drew was, again, you've got an older voter demographic in Napa. This idea of the dollar staying local may not be resonating with them because they're not currently connected with the schools. 
So they, they're, they're not as invested in this idea of, of it staying local. However, in American Canyon, when we told the American Canyon voter on the poll, what if the dollars only stay in American Canyon for American Canyon schools? Go ahead, Kelly. It rose to 71%, a dramatic increase. American Canyon was very vested in this idea about the dollar staying local. Again, what's the voter demographic in American Canyon? Much younger, higher proportion of current, um, uh, uh, in, the voter, in the voter landscape, current younger people who are parents currently connected to our schools, right? Higher proportion of voters are going to be currently connected to the schools. This idea really resonated with the American Canyon voter, way over 55%. Next slide. So the next question for the voter on the poll is, if you're willing to vote yes, how much are you willing to pay? And so we have to ask it the complicated way because this is how it will read on the ballot. So we want to kind of, we, we want to test it in the way it will read on the ballot. So um, for bond measures, right, you get taxed, the homeowner gets taxed on their assessed value of the home, not their market value on Zillow, but their assessed value. If you go to your property tax bill, where you, you, you see all those taxes we have, you know, have to pay. So it's always tough to, to look at there's an assessed value on there. And that is the, 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 the value that would be used to calculate the, the cost of the tax. So um, average assessed value uh, in the area is about 500,000, 500,000. So if you say $19 per 100K, that would mean that for the, 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 uh, the average homeowner, the average homeowner, that the that at nineteen dollars per hundred thousand dollars per hundred thousand dollars of assessed value, you're looking at approximately a hundred dollars a year, right? So you, and then we increase it and we ask, what about at this rate at twenty four dollars? What about at thirty dollars? What about at thirty five? You see here that it's clearly at the at the lower level, we we barely hit the fifty five percent mark. Only fifty two percent say they'd vote yes in Napa. And as we ask for more money, the support declines. What's the big picture walk away from this? The, the voter in the city of Napa is tax sensitive. There is tax sensitivity. In American Canyon, there's also um, tax sensitivity. L more natural support at the lower tax rate. 61% say they vote yes on a tax measure that only costs $19 per 100K. For the average homeowner, that's, you know, again, between $8,500 a year, depending on the assessed value of their home. But the same trend persists. It, the more we ask for, the more, the less support we, we, we have, right? So again, tax sensitivity is a reality in both parts of, the, of, of NBUSD and in Napa County. So that's a complicated way to ask the voter. We ask it a more simple way just to kind of see if, if, if the, the having to do all the math is getting in the way of the voter understanding the cost of the measure. So next slide, Kelly. So then we just, the firm says, what about if the tax costs you $86 a year flat? And that, ga that gained us a little bit more support, right? Um, you'll see in Napa that gets us past the 55% threshold. When we say, what about $158 per year flat, which would be at the higher tax rate, the support um, diminishes. So again, consistent trend, there's tax sensitivity. In American Canyon, when we asked it the more simplified way, when you ask the $86 per year, we're well above the, the support level needed. You see there, we're about, if you add those up, we're at about 65% supporting a, a, at the lower tax rate. And it drops to, to about 58% when you ask them about the cost of $158 a year. But again, same theory, the more we ask for, the less the support. Next slide. So after that, we asked the, the voter um, or this firm asked the voter about what projects would you be willing to fund? And they, and they get ranked in terms of order of, uh, of support. You'll see that in Napa, the top projects were the reparation um, the reparation, uh, replacement of roofs, the modernization, right? The basic modernization. 
And then next came um, classrooms, technology, math, science, and engineering, uh, career technical education classrooms, and then the removal of the hazardous materials. Next slide. American Canyon, a um, little different. Um, they, uh, their first one were, were upgrades around classrooms for math, science, engineering, and tech. And then the reparation, the modernization was the second most favorable project category. Um, area, uh, category. And then third was the, the career technical education classroom upgrades. And then fourth for them was safety, which I'm not surprised as superintendent because I have a lot of conversations with um, City of American Canyon school parents that talk a lot about campus safety. I think they feel more vulnerable um, bordering Solano County there. So safety is always top of mind with many of the parents that I interface with in, in the city of AC. Next. Then the next uh, wave of questions is we, we put forth or the firm puts forth um, positive arguments, lots of positive arguments around uh, you know, favoring a bond and to assess what are the most convincing arguments for the voter. The first for Napa was this idea that the kids in Napa deserve the same opportunities as kids everywhere and that they should have access to high quality education. And the second one in Napa was that the schools are really old. They're over 60 years old, so they need to be repaired, right? And then there's a, a bunch of other positive arguments that we test. Next slide. In American Canyon, it was a little different. Same first top reason, right? American Canyon kids deserve the same as every, everyone else in other regions. But for them, you see that, that, that argument around by law, all money raised will be spent locally to repair, improve American Canyon schools. And they can't, the money can't go to Napa schools. That ranked second highest. Again, this idea of the dollar staying local really resonates with the American Canyon voter, according to this poll. Next slide. So now we've asked them, we've, we've, we've talked to them about the money staying local, about the cost, about the projects and these positive arguments. And we once again, show them that ballot and say, now that you've heard some things, where are you now as a voter? And for Napa, after all of that, at this interim ballot test, it stayed stuck at 55%, didn't move. So we're still at, at 55%. In American Canyon, there was a slight increase. Next slide, Kelly. After all of that information, the American Canyon voter rose from 56% at the beginning of the poll. And at this point in the poll, we're at 59%. The last questions on the poll are about negative arguments. We intentionally do this to see do, how do these different arguments influence the voter to kind of assess what we're up against, right? If we were to go out and, and try and, and pass a bond. So in Napa, go ahead, Kelly, next slide. There are the, here are the four negative arguments. Um, the, the, top, the negative argument that, that, that uh, voters ranked that really resonated with them in the poll was that right now is not a good time. There's been a pandemic. People are struggling to stay afloat. Don't, don't raise taxes right now. The second one was they just got Measure H back in 2016. What'd they do with the money? Don't ask for another bond. You just got $269 million. The third was about um, don't be fooled. Bonds take a long time to pay off. They say it's going to cost X, but it's really going to cost a lot more, right? And then the last one is you can't trust the district. They mismanage. So you see in order how those, how those negative arguments um, ranked in, for, for Napa people that we polled. Um, next, in American Canyon, it wasn't that different. Same top negative argument, not right now, you know, inflation, pandemic, et cetera. Same second reason, they just passed a bond back in 2016. And then that trust factor rose to number three and the, the, the paying off of the bond over time was the, was the fourth. So after they hear the negative arguments, we show them the ballot sample ballot language one more time to see how do these negative arguments influence the voters thinking. And the results were in Napa, it dipped to 50% 50, 50 after they heard the negative arguments. And in American Canyon, it, it um, dipped back from uh, to 56%. So they, they stayed hovering above that, right above the cusp of the 55% requirement to pass a bond. 
So those are the results. Um, the research firm makes some conclusions and recommendations. Go ahead, Kelly, next slide. Based on this, you know, back when we when we polled in 2016, or 20, uh, 20, I'm sorry, 2020, I said, you know, so based on this data, what are our chances? And they said, no, nope, you have a lot of work to do. You need to restore the trust with the community. Um, you're gonna have to make decisions that resonate with the more conservative taxpayer, clearly. Um, and so fast forward two years later, based on this data and the, the, the assessment of this new idea of separating the two, the two school bonds, right, into two separate school bonds, their conclusion is yes, you know, it's not, it's not a win for sure, but you're within striking distance based on this data, you're going to have to do careful planning and execution. That's part of why we're getting this message out to discuss it with many people, because we want to inform potential planning and execution. The positive signs in the data, the voters care about public education. There was sufficient natural support, right? At the beginning, 55% in Napa, 56% in, in the city of American Canyon. That's, that's right on the cusp. So we have natural support without having done anything. The popular projects are projects that we need to get done. There's, a, there's alignment there. The positive arguments resonated with the voter and all of the ballot tests stayed at 55% or above until we got to that last one uh, around that where, that where the Napa voter was influenced by the negative arguments. The challenges are clearly there's tax rate sensitivity. Some of the negative arguments did get some traction as, the, as that last data point showed. And there's a lot of unknowns right now. Pandemic is still persisting, massive inflation, economy issues, and an election climate. Those are always variables that could influence voters. Last slide. So what are the recommendations? This is clearly, I wanna say a snapshot in time. It's not a crystal ball. Although um, True North tells us that their data is, 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 is fairly predictive, so it's very good to use for, for, for planning purposes. It's very clear that if I were to recommend to the school board, if our, us as staff were to recommend to the school board to pursue a future bond measure, it needs to be modest. It needs to be a, the more modest, lower tax rate. Even though we have good, you know, $500 million in need, do we wanna go and pursue as much money as possible? Sure, because we could get more done. However, we would not be tuning into the data and tuning into the voter sentiment. And clearly the data shows that we have to keep it within their comfort zone. And we think it's a more viable strategy to go for two small bonds, if we're gonna pursue, go for two small bonds, do a really good job on the execution so that we have the trust of the community and we're not fighting uh, up against the sort of decisions of the past, right? So um, the, the lower rate at $19, $20 per 100,000 of assessed value. Project priorities have to be the ones that the voters care about. And we have to do a great job on district communications. We really need to, we think if we expand and, and, and really push this dialogue around, hey, two bonds, one in American Canyon for American Canyon schools, one in Napa for Napa schools, that if we get that message out and work that message, that, that we can get it, we can use it as more leverage to increase um, the support in the community. And then we would run two completely independent campaigns if we decided to pursue with their own campaign committees. In fact, if the bonds passed, just so you know, we would have to have two um, a separate bond oversight committees, one for the city of American Canyon voters and one for the city of Napa. So it would be separate campaigns, two different uh, bond execution plans and two oversight committees in the future if indeed we went this, this path. So if you can release the share screen so I can see people's faces and just get some reactions to the data. Go ahead, Skip. Well, I hope that uh, I hope we're successful in, in passing a bond or bonds. I mean, if for no other reason than it's another CBOC. But um, a couple of items, and uh, I'll just run through them briefly. <clears throat> I think we need to, as was pointed out in one of the 
survey responses talk about the true cost of the bond measure. It kind of makes the case worse in terms of raw dollars, but it does bolster the uh, reestablishment of, of honesty or, or put it more bluntly, it takes away uh, one of the counter arguments from the tax, uh, the non-tax groups and, and such. So I would uh, I'd say we've got to talk about what what the bond cost is, as uh, we've talked about here before. Two, inflation is just setting in. And so I think that's going to skew the results by the time the bond hits the uh, the voters. And I don't, you know, Janet Yellen aside and all the rest of that, I don't see inflation getting substantially better uh, in the near term. Uh, you're going to have the conception that the problem that is the money needed to uh, to fund the capital projects in the district is static. I mean, we fixed it once 15 years ago. How come you're asking for more money? That mindset um, is something we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and I hope that the bond uh, committee will, will do that. Not the bond oversight committee, but the, A the committee put together to pass this. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As you've uh, seen from some of the arguments that have appeared in the paper over Measure L, the fire protection uh, measure, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of negative reception out there. I don't know when you, you when you intend to time these uh, bond measures, but uh, keep your eye on what else is on the uh, on the ballot at that time. Um, it's going to hinge on election turnout, obviously, um, and the type of person that turns out, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. It looks to me like the SFID, while it may make the bond more viable, also reduces the school district's flexibility in meeting uh, exigent uh, needs. American Canyon is a, is a classic example, I guess, uh, in that that money became available then to meet other things, and we don't know you never know what's going to pop up on the horizon, and and so just be aware that it's tying the district's hands and dealing with that since the, the funds are uh, targeted. Uh, also, the survey was conducted with no active, although there were questions, negative uh, aspects of a bond measure that were that were uh, uh, vocalized in the uh, survey. That's not the same as an active uh, uh, campaign by uh, well, you know who it's by, and uh, so I would I would view the uh, I'd view the survey results with a jaundiced eye in that regard. Uh, as you pointed out, approval is going to be linked to the amount of the bond, and that's also a double-edged sword. Even splitting it up into two SFIDs, because uh, it's a matter of how many times you're going to go to the well, and every time you go to the well, uh, it gets a little more uh, difficult. Um, and that's it. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Just so you know, at the modest rate, and, and you're right, SFIDs that does put the constraint on the district around, we, you lose flexibility in that way. Um, but we, we've assessed our, 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 you know, we think that it's, it's worth it. Um, uh, we think that, you know, but, and we, and we've, so I appreciate that feedback. But just so you know, um, at the low rate, uh, $20, about 19 something and some change, almost 20 bucks um, per 100,000, that would generate 200 million in the city of Napa and 25 million in the city of American Canyon. Could I make a comment? My mic's working now. Hi, Jill. <laughs> Hi. Um, for the first time probably ever, um, it appears um, Dr. Massetti has been meeting with the Napa Valley Taxpayers Association. And we discussed with her the possibility of doing two bonds. So the money stays in the city of Napa and the same for American Canyon. And the Taxpayers Association at this point appears to, that it's gonna be supporting her efforts for the bond. Um, she's been waiting for a letter from us, which she has not received yet, but I'm unaware of any time in the past um, that a Taxpayers Association would be pro or just short of pro um, school bonds. And one of the other reasons, and other reasons for it is because it's a smaller amount, <clears throat> excuse me, a smaller amount that's going to be asked for. And of course, what Dr. Massetti has done since she's been here and fixing things, if you will, um, 
has has been amazing and impressive and she appears to be someone who um we can trust with our school bond money thank you jill i appreciate that i'll go back to mute <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Yeah, Thanks, we've Kip. worked we've worked um, closely with the Napa Taxpayers Association. Um, we've actually shared this data with them, um, and um, and in many ways, they 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 one of the reasons that we came up with the SFID strategy and conducted our research and kind of looked at other examples in the state is because they did illuminate the concern around you know um, you know they, they, I, I I think that. With a more conservative um, uh, uh, taxpayer voter, there's always the interest around the dollar staying more most more local. So we do give up flexibility, but the idea seems to resonate with with a lot of voters um, when you frame it that way, because they want they want to see the money go to the schools that they drive by, right? Um, that their kids attend, that are in their neighborhoods. So, so we've been we've been grateful for their time. Are there any restrictions as far as when you go out up to bid for third party providers, uh, restricting the ability to, to have a, an overall bid for both pots of money, or do you have to have separate bids for each pot of money? If that makes sense. I would, I would have to look into that. Um, that's a good question, Gary. Um, if we have to do, do you know Kelly around the bidding? I, I might defer to Carlos, but my best guess, and this is not an official answer, would be I think that for economy of scale, you could probably bid them the same and then parse it out in the accounting. Um, the district uses, well, all school districts use account codes to track expenses. So you can take one PO and attach it to multiple account codes. So you could potentially bid something and fund a portion of it to American Canyon and a portion of it to Napa, but you'd have to be really specific on your bid form, making sure you're tracking it all separate. Do I, anything else, Carlos, that I missed? No, that's right, because there, there's a legal constraint. You cannot use the bond proceeds from one SFID in the other. So you'd have to be able to track it in some capacity to give this, the two citizen oversight committees the ability to conclude that it was spent appropriately. Yeah, and that's that. That's uh, what I've heard after four years of being here is there's a trust factor. So the, the other reason we like the SFID because it builds in that inherent trust and accountability mechanism. So we're trying to do everything to show the community members, the voters, the taxpayer, like, okay, what can we do to increase that trust and accountability? Let's build in this inherent accountability to the, to the, into the system. And, and we're legally required, you can't mix the dollars, can't, can't, you know, that's a guarantee. So that's the other, the other reason that it's appealing. That's a great question, um, Gary. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get kind of more specific with our bond consultants around that. Thank you, Carlos, for that answer, but we'll, we'll definitely do our, our homework on that. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's something I'd seen with a large corporation like Sutter Health, where we had a lot of the same types of, there are individual board of directors and, and hospital boards and things, but you still had to try to merge it all together into, into large costs, even though yeah. they're supported by multiple small little entities. Yeah, and I can think through the two mechanism, which is the the bid form and then the board, you know, the mechanism for like board approving. I can already visualize that we have ways to be able to leverage the economy of scale and separate within that. So you, you've got me kind of thinking about the visualization of that. So it seems very doable. I would just again cross check everything with our attorneys and kind of do our, our homework. Um, it is a new strategy in Napa County. It's never been done before. This has never been done in Napa County. And just FYI, one of the technical steps, um, we would go to the board in, in June if we decide to do it with the recommendation. But uh, what you have to do in order for your board's resolution to be valid if they pass it and authorize it to pursue the two SFIDs, the County Board of Supervisors is required to first uh, authorize the separation and, and create the two SFIDs according to the voter map. The Napa County Board of Supervisors has already done that. So we got that passed at the main meeting of the Board of Supervisors, just so that we would be ready if we decided to go. So I have a question and a comment. Um, okay. I guess I'll start with the obvious. Obviously, it's a difficult environment right now. 
And I don't know what the target would be, presumably November. I, I don't yeah. know. November um, 2022. I, I don't expect that it's going to get any better between now and then. It's probably going to get worse. Um, obviously, this company knows what they're doing, was super thorough and, and well presented. Thank you. Um, the one question I have is the, the likely participant in a survey like this, is it, I would think that it undercounts conservatives for, for that people who are likely to participate in a survey like this are more likely to be yes voters than, and, and, and I think it's, it has a danger of undercounting no votes. Uh, because I just think conservative people are don't typically or or are more likely to say no thank you I, I don't want to participate in a survey like this is is that something that True North commented on or does that make uh, sense that's I didn't ask it that's a I, I, that's a really um, I love the nuanced question so I'm actually going to note that because um, it's that's that's a really good way to frame that question to probe and, and pick up the data a little bit at, a, at another deeper level so I appreciate the question in that way um, so that may be possible um, but what we were told by True North was that um, the voter demographic in the sample size was very much uh, the voter, the likely voter demographic for November 2022. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to think of like where your nuanced question fit, fits in that, um, right? Uh, because um, the, according to them, you know, there, there was a, a significant uh, conservative voter uh, profile in the mix of the sample because mm -hmm. that's part of the Napa voter profile. Um, and, and that the sample did create a microcosm of what could be expected to come out to vote in 2022. Yeah. Okay. But I'm going to note that we have a lot of accessibility to the research team. So I'm going to note that because that's a really interesting way to kind of think about the data as well. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Yeah, I do have, I do have one comment. It's, uh, it's, uh, Skip had said this earlier. So, um, for example, with uh, the 200 million that that um, I heard for Napa, um, the uh, amount of money that the bond issue could raise. Yeah. Um, have Have we done? You know, obviously the last go around, we had the benefits of lower uh, lower interest rates, and we certainly had, unfortunately, higher construction costs too. So. Um, but is there any guesstimate at this point of how much the total cost would actually be? There's the $200 million we're raising, but is there, is there some idea of how much the bond issue is really going to, so let's say it's 200 million, how much it's really going to cost a taxpayer over the term? Yeah. So um, again, it, it's contingent upon the, the variable, the interest rate variable right. that you described. So, you know, I think it's, it's um, a little difficult to uh, predict. I know that, um, um, with our last bond of 269 million, the measure H, uh, I think the number that, that we have calculated is approximately um, shy of um, 600 million. So it's, it's about double. Um, so I, I have not uh, gotten into that. Of course, if we go to campaign, I think Skip brought it up, right? Like if we go, if we do advance, right, we're, we're, we haven't gotten into kind of the, like we're going and we're campaigning mode. We're doing all of this engagement and getting all this feedback from different um, groups like yourself. But if we do decide to go, those are kind of, those are the details that we're gonna wanna have like at the touch of our fingers, right? Because that is gonna be a negative argument. So we need to be prepared for the negative, negative argument. And uh, something I like to try and pride myself on is transparency and honesty. So if I have a way to predict that, I'd want to upfront put that number out, right? So, you know, just, yeah, you're right. It does, we do pay it over time. It does cost more, it does cost more than what we're, uh, the, the, the original amount we're asking for. And here's what we predict it will cost. Yeah, there's always that push to, to make it attractive to voters in the short term without them realizing really what it's gonna cost over the long term, so thanks. Yeah, and I think negative arguments up the, out the gate um, could, you know, could be hurtful in a campaign. However, 
what I've worked through with our bond consultant is I'm up a lot uh, up against the past being loaded with a lot of mistrust and, and sense of people say X and then down the road, it becomes Y. And I believe that if the district goes through one more round of that, this place will never be able to pass a school bond. <laughs> and so I feel a, a moral imperative to set it up so that you know we're as honest and transparent as possible out the gate. It is, it is the future of the children in this community and in the future of our facilities and the schools that serve them that, that we need to execute um, tuning into all these little details and making sure that we're very, very um, true to our word, right? Um, that, that's gonna be huge, not just for the short-term gain of this bond, but I believe for the long-term of, 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 of the community. So we're, we're, Mike and I have been very, very committed to that. I mean, Mike tells me all the time, he, he, he's never seen bond data, he's never seen polling data um, shared, right? Um, they've done polls in the past. We found them. Uh, the board hadn't seen polling data in the past. So this is part of that transparency, right? Starting out the gate, like here's the polling data. Here's our logic based on the data. And we're, uh, we did it in a public board meeting. And we, by the end of our um, stakeholder meetings with different groups, Mike and I probably would have met close to 500 people sharing this data. So we're trying to be really upfront. Thanks. <clears throat> Other questions or comments from the committee? Um, Dr. Musetti, is how does the uh, proposed assessment of this bond compare to the assessment for Measure H? Is there any data on that? Oh, the polling data? Um, no, um, if, if we go for the 200 million oh. or the $19 per, yeah. per thousand, yeah, or so per hundred thousand. How does that compare to Measure H? Yeah, for, how does so, that compare to Measure H's assessment? Um, I, measure H. So Measure H generated two hundred sixty-nine million. Mike, do you remember what the um, dollar amount was? I yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to look, Kevin, and, and find that out. But that's a good question to find out yeah. what, that, what that was per assessed value. Um, so you're looking for the dollar amount per hundred thousand assessed, if I'm not mistaken. I want to say it was in the high 20s. I remember looking at a document, but uh, we'd have to cross check our facts. Hey, Kevin, yeah, you, can just, you can just take a look at your property tax bill, right? That's true. <laughs> yeah, you do. You have to Thanks, do a little God. math. You'd have to do a little bit of math, but yeah. Sorry. But that certainly could be a plus if it's lower. You know, political. Yeah, we know it is going to be lower, right? We know by, by default it'll be lower because of. Um, Wait, let me think about that mathematically. But um, it, since it's only generating 200 million, well, it's generating 220, you know, it's only gonna generate 200 million. I, it, it, you've got that extra variable that you're splitting the two voter demographics and combined it generates 225. So I, I'd have to kind of think about it. But um, yeah. I, I have that information, Dr. Massetti. Oh, it's, on it's on Ballotpedia. Um, you were at 39 per 100,000 assessed value. So it was quite a bit higher. Way higher. Yeah, similar to the, similar to how much does a bond cost over its lifetime? I think that's information that you, know, you we would want to have at the ready um, for potential questions. Yeah, and like I said, those are the details. If we get into campaign mode, those are all the things we have to have at our ever at our fingertips for sure. So if we go back into the Wayback Machine and Measure H and how that was launched, um, what would be the communication around what projects would be planned for, sorry for the background noise, uh, planned for the new bond, you know, compared to the, hey, we're passing Measure H for 269, but here's the capital plan that's 595 million and all the confusion that that caused. Um, and then we what, campaigning on, on facilities master plans. I'm sorry. I said we cannot campaign on a capital right. on a on a facilities master plan, which I think was the was the issue with Measure H. But would there be a list of projects? For sure, for sure. Require it's required that we have a project list. 
Um, and then there's the required project list that has to be included in the voter information. And then there's what the whole campaign mode that we get in. The campaign mode that Measure H was in, um, unfortunately, was they showed the master plan for every school site, which was, like you said, $600 million, right? How could you campaign on 600 million, that you were going to do $600 million when you were only getting 269? So that, that's kind of the, the, the challenge of that last campaign. Mike's presentation is all about the projects that we're thinking about, the project categories. Um, so should we transition to that? We were, gonna, we were gonna pull them into uh, two by two meetings or, or two to three. Oh, oh right, right. We had talked um, about that. That's right. So that's right. a future, uh, future one, yeah. Yeah, because it, it's kind of lengthy. So we do want you as CBOC members to, to know about uh, the, the project categories that we're thinking of. Um, but that's right. We we it, it'd be too much for the length of one. Well, Kevin, what we're thinking about, and I, I we'll have Melanie um, be reaching out, but we'd like to schedule meetings with uh, the CBOC members to do that exact that that, that presentation. Go over those uh, the project lists that we're thinking about. We just can't do it. Um, we have to do it, you know, because we can't. We have to follow the Brown Act, so we'd have to pull you in in groups of two or three uh, to make that happen. Yeah, a little bit more intimate setting so you can ask information because that's kind of more nitty gritty level work. And and presumably that project list or that presentation of the potential projects would answer the um, negative questions about um, demonstration that the money is spent on the quote unquote appropriate projects, i.e. taking into account the reality the demographics the district is facing as well as um you know a, a generally quantitative based analysis on how the district arrived at evaluating what projects to spend money on yeah well i, I think yes kevin it, it takes into consideration um you know we we have to take into consideration school closures um but we're not we're not in that situation where we're saying we're going to you know, talk about school closures, but we would not be, we have, we say, you know, pretty uh, vigorously, we say, you know, we're not going to invest money in schools, we're going to close. Um, so we have to be very thoughtful uh, of the money that we, that we would spend uh, out there. And then as far as, you know, the assessments that to make some decisions around, yes, we have that. And, you know, I think we've shared with you the modernization program plan, which is really what's driving the majority of the bond you know, the, the fact that we, what we need to get done in our, our permanent buildings uh, to continue to make them warm, safe and dry. Um, and that's the majority of the work that, uh, that would be accomplished at the bond. But there are some other projects um, that we would go over as well too. Hey, Kevin, this is Richard. Richard, yep, I see you have your hand up. So uh, the, uh, the, the 2016 bond, we paid uh, 36.9 per, per 100,000. The Measure M, which was on the 2006 bond, was a 43.3 dollars, uh, and and and, uh, and uh, the 2002 was 22.1 dollars per hundred. And I guess the reason we would have more money this year for a lower rate would be because the assessed valuations have gone up so high. Yeah. In, in the property taxes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. That that's where you 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 gain more despite the more conservative ask. Correct. Is that the average assessed value is so much higher? Hey, Richard, I appreciate you saying those numbers. I didn't write them down. That's good. You send those to me in an email when you get a moment, please. The meeting's recorded. We got them, Mike. Oh, that's true. Sorry. Thank you. Melanie has it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just reading. I, I have my tax bill. That's why I'm reading the diary off of it. So. so you followed Scott's instructions. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah, you did. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm glad it's so readily available. <laughs> and, I, and I think the difference from the number that I read and from Richard's is that mine's the ballot language. So it was a estimated. And then what Richard's reading is what's actually on his tax bill. So that, that probably that, accounts for the difference. That's yeah. correct because B, G, BD wanted to have it lower than what, what she had estimated when, when we ran across that. She wanted, she wanted the amount to be less than what they had predicted. Yeah. I was on that committee too. So. Yeah, I, part of the argument too can be that you know we're leveraging an era where we have high assessed value, so there's a benefit there, right? Yeah. We can generate more revenue without asking so much of each individual homeowner because the average assessed value is high. So, again, building all that argumentation. So, just based on like what you're hearing, can I just get a sense of what you think? Like, you think this is this is a, a strategy? I kind of heard from Jill. Skip, I heard you say like you hope it passes, but just to kind of 
the rest of you on the call, just a, a sense of like, what do you think? Like you think going down this road of a, a continuing to explore and vet the strategy makes sense for us as, a, as an organization and for the community? Yeah, definitely. I, 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 can, I can certainly see just from the, uh, the workings I've had with the American Scan Canyon uh, uh, music departments and things, there's, there's a much more powerful or, or centralized uh, desire of the, the people down there to really work together as a group and it's, it's ours. You know, they, they're very, very uh, own it themselves uh, compared to what we see here in Napa. Uh, mainly possibly some of them might be because there's two different high schools and that and everybody works together anyway but uh, anyway that's just something i've seen i agree with it i think it's good anyone else any other start? comments anybody Um, the reality, I just, um, uh, one last thought, Kevin, the reality, just to make it clear, is if we pursue the two SFIDs, there's the, the, the piece that, that um, Skip brought up around less flexibility. We have this constraint we're working within. Um, but um, the other thing that could happen, just to be really clear and think the movie all the way through the end, is one could pass and the other not pass. So you could have a situation where, you know, it passes in American Canyon and it doesn't pass in Napa or vice versa. Right now, it seems like that, that we've got a, a, a increased likelihood that it'll, that'll, it will pass in American Canyon, but that would be a reality in the school district. And that's kind of the, the risk that you run when you do two SFIDs. And then we'd have to figure how to leverage that for the future, right? Um, you know. So, but that we, we have thought that scenario out. We go, is it still worth the risk? We do, uh, we, because if we don't pass a school bond period, then there's zero, right? So, um, so that's Eddie, yep. what's, it, what's it cost to run this? What's it cost to have a campaign? Um, so- the And where does the money come from? Yeah, so we, that's a great question. So uh, campaign will probably cost um, in, in a, a, about $300,000. Um, and we have to fundraise for the campaign. So we can't, uh, we don't use district dollars for the campaign. So two things, we have to fundraise for the campaign efforts. Um, and secondly, we have to be mindful as um, district leadership that we're not campaigning um, during um, work time. So that's the other way, right? Like campaigning happens um, before and after the work day on the weekends. Um, so those are the kind of, people often think that the district's spending a ton of money on the campaign, district dollars, our time on the campaign, but it is extra time that we need to invest outside of our regular duties. Um, in terms of the personnel involved in the campaign, and secondly, we have to get fun we have to get donations. So we 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 do not use our our district funds for the campaign itself. Great question. Okay, I'm done. Kevin. Back, sorry for the background noise. So the reality is that to fund um, you know capital improvements. For school construction in California, one needs bond measures, right? Um, I think you nailed it, and um, it you know we have a hole to dig out of to demonstrate that there's logic and reasoning behind not only seeking a bond measure but uh, how those projects are selected, and demonstrating absolute uh, transparency and all of the numbers um, for the committee members that. Uh, didn't attend the annual report presentation. The committee made, um, you know, some recommendations on lessons learned for our from our involvement over the past five um, annual reports. Um, and I think it would be beneficial for uh, a more in-depth discussion. Um, you know, going through those bullet point items. Uh, in whatever Brown Act conforming venue uh, is appropriate. Um, but it's really a catalog of uh, essentially high points of specific comments from the various annual reports, as well as uh, topics that were you know, discussed um, on an ongoing basis uh, at, at the various meetings. So 
uh, think that would be beneficial for um, for that discussion to be had. That's a great, great suggestion. So I've noted that. Thank you. Um, I thought of one other thing I'd just like to close with is just so I, you're not sideswiped. Again, going back to honesty and transparency and leveraging the opportunity to speak directly uh, to all of you as leaders in our community and, and, and public servants in, in this capacity as uh, members of the CBOC. I am going to send out a letter to every voter um, uh, uh, in advance of going to the school board because I, I don't want the voter to I don't want the school board to vote and that be the mechanism where people hear about this strategy for the first time. So I want to proactively tell the community that I'm going to the board with this recommendation for the strategy, if indeed we decide to move forward with the two SFIDs. So um, if we, at the end of the month, when we huddle as a staff and, and based on all the feedback that we got, we've gotten, we decide to proceed, I will have a letter prepared to go out the first early June, letting the voter know that I'm bringing this recommendation to the school board. And this is going to be my recommendation as superintendent for our bond strategy, uh, pending the board's uh, consideration and approval. So you should receive one. Let me know what you think. All right. Okay, Mike, okay. And I have another meeting. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you listening and thank you for your thoughtful questions. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, Kelly, back to you. Apologies for the background noise. All right. Well, then we are going to go ahead and move back to our agenda. Hold on one second. And I'm getting back to the screen share. We were going to advance to item number 10, right? We were. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that now. Come back to all this. Um, all right, future meetings and agenda items. So here's your reminder on how to find all of the information, but we wanted to talk today about two items. The first being um, specific comments. So one of the items that um, came up in the specific comment list from the annual report was the district or the district, sorry, the committee desiring that the district circle back on questions raised in the specific comments on a more regular basis. Um, so Mike and I were actually discussing that over the last few days and wanted to talk to the committee about how we might do that as a regular agenda item to try to start to put some of these items to bed on both sides so that both the committee and the district can feel like the item is concluded and we can check it off the list. Uh, Mike, am I missing anything there? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it's exactly speaking to what you were mentioning, Kevin, um, before uh, Rosanna uh, uh, logged off, um, is, is those specific comments and coming up with, with what a process would be, what that would look like, whether it's, uh, as Kelly mentioned, you know, uh, uh, regularly, it's, a, it's a something we talk about at, at, a, at, at a CVSC meeting, um, or there's another structure to, to look at, um, and I, I, I don't have any ideas off the top of my head. Um, what I was, I'll throw it out there, was that if the committee is up to it, it could be that um, myself, Kelly, uh, Kevin, and Barb uh, Franco, who is the vice chair, we would uh, meet separately and discuss some, some different ideas and then bring it back to the committee for uh, further review uh, to say, yeah, we like that idea or no, we don't like that idea. Um, but that's just a suggestion, folks. I, I'm not married to it, but just to you know, give some direction. It could be that, but, it, but the interest from the district is to definitely figure out a, a, a method for us to, to you know, revisit the recommendations um, and to just determine when we as a committee um, have answered that recommendation, or is it something that needs to be continually, um, needs to, it's a recommendation that needs to continually be looked at on a regular basis too, so on that, so. And the backdrop of this was to, um, um clean up and get get a uh, what i called an as-built uh listing of uh comments and responses and get that all reconciled um between now and the submission of the next annual report which would cover the 21 22 fiscal year which um at that point in time essentially all of measure h bond funds would be spent down so uh, mike your comment is that 
the four of us would get together and talk about potential ways to integrate this into the meeting, right? That's a, yeah, it was just a suggestion. Yeah. Yes, Kevin. Okay, so open to comments from the committee on um, moving forward with that. Go ahead, Skip. It could be as simple as uh, one pager added to every uh, every meeting, just listing all the specific comments and what's being done, or all the, all the open ones. The problem is that we go from year to year currently, and some of those have never been addressed after the initial uh, uh, trustee response, which was, yeah, we'll look into it or we'll work on it or whatever. So all I was interested in was seeing something to, to know that it's not lost in the weeds. Doesn't need to be anything very complicated. Yeah, and I, I think partly for me, um, Skip would be to, again, as a suggestion to meet with Kevin and Barb, determine which of those we still need to answer. Um, and then if it's a, like you suggested, a, a one page document that is uh, submitted uh, at each one of our um, bond oversight committee meetings, I obviously would have some sort of discussion on that, but uh, but for review for the members, uh, I, we're we're open. We just don't want to make an assumption on that it should be, you know, this idea, whatever that idea is, without obviously the committee weighing in on what they like to see. Well, so I know everybody's read the uh, annual report in detail because it's under all of your pillows. But Exhibit H, I mean, we could just attach Exhibit H to the uh, agenda, or and we could use that as a working document. So. Unless there's any other comments in the interest of moving things along for tonight, uh, why don't the four of us, Barb, myself, uh, Kelly, and Mike, take on uh, recommendations on how this topic could be integrated on a regular basis as a standing agenda item into the meetings, and we will uh, we will discuss that in our at our July meeting. Everybody, good with that? Any any comments on that? Sounds fine, Kevin, to me. Works for me. Yeah. Uh, I, but, well, I, I think we should be cautious about putting things on that are going to be permanent, especially since four of us are leaving uh, near the end the, in a couple more meetings. So uh, we should perhaps try this, Kevin, and then see if the rest of the people like it afterwards. All right, yes. so the other item that we wanted to cover under future meetings is our next meeting was uh, planned or discussed to be at the new Napa Junction Elementary School site. So we'd be meeting in person for the first time in a very long time. Um, and one of the things we wanted to talk about was how we would wanna structure that meeting. Would we want it to be simply a site visit? Would we want it to be a site visit and then kind of have an abbreviated meeting along with it? Um, so we were looking for some feedback from the committee on what you'd like to see in that meeting, because obviously doing a full tour of the site, in addition to doing a full meeting would be kind of time prohibitive. So we're open to suggestions there as well. Kelly, I have a suggestion. Since we're down in American Canyon, I think we should go to that and we should go to American Canyon as well, high school, and visit both of them to give the new people an, ex uh, an example of what we've been doing in the past. You mean um, the middle, high school, the middle or, school or the high school, Richard? And the middle school and high school. Yeah, maybe. Well, it, it, two anyway, two of them down there. Whether well, it's you, well, well, I think you want us to go to places we're visiting, where, where we're doing pro active projects, correct? And that would be the middle school and Napa. Well, Napa Junction. That's correct. Yeah, that'd be fine. I'm just thinking to show the show off what we've done, what you've done. I mean, got it. Okay. That's my that's my suggestion. And you know, we can carry on a meeting as we go if we really have things we want to talk about. But 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 essentially two site visits as long as we're there. Yeah, I'm thinking if you do site two site visits, which I, I mean, I love to show off the middle school project, it's really cool. But if we do two site visits, that is not gonna leave any time for a meeting, which is totally fine. Your meeting can be a site visit. Just wanna make sure you guys understand that. Okay. Well, the other question is, is can, since it's vacation time, will people be able to be there? Because it would really be nice if we everybody sort of saw each other again, so sort of, for the first time and for some of us the last time? <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's take those one at a time. So uh, go ahead, Skip. Well, as the uh, resident two-headed ogre, 
Uh, we've only got about three meetings before we disappear. I'm not sure there's time for any, uh, for one of those meetings to be sacrificed to a tour. Just my opinion. Yes. I'd like to say visits. I'm new. Well, I, I think it would just help to coordinate. I mean, get people on board of what, we're, what we've been doing though, Skip. I mean, I agree with you that uh, some of these meetings uh, are important, I mean, in terms of what's going on, but it's, I think it's also important that we, we don't just leave and people say, oh, what, what did we have, what did we, what did we do? What didn't we do? What, what are you doing? Because I mean, that's what we're doing. And we will have an opportunity to talk to people maybe in person uh, sort of and let people know what we've been doing as well or what we do. Sorry about the background noise again. What would people think about using the project updates portion of the meeting to do uh, a site visit of one of the holding the meeting at say Napa Junction, using the time of this of the project updates to do a, a site visit and conducting the regular business from that venue. Having one meeting, having the July meeting at Napa Junction and having the September meeting at uh, the middle school. Yeah, well, that seems reasonable to me. Skip. You too. That way we can still parse through some amount of business. Well, I've come into a couple of uh, oversight committees, you know, midway through. And I, I think we're overplaying the necessity to uh, to well, coddle the new members. But uh, I, I made my point. I just don't see. I think it's better the time better spent on uh, finishing up and and uh, finishing up our tour in terms of uh, getting a last minute handle on things so that we can. Uh, what we really need to probably leave the uh, the uh, new members is our input on what's happened to date so that they're not uh, trying to put together an annual report, um, having only been here for, you know, some portion of the year. That's more important, I think, than seeing a project. But I'm just one person, so do whatever the committee wants and so be it. I can throw out another suggestion, Kevin, into the committee. Yep. That would I, be- Go uh, ahead. We may be suggesting the same thing, but go ahead. You know, I, what I could do is that you could continue to hold your meetings as you have, if, if you feel you would like to do the, use that use that time. And then we could schedule times for committee members to visit uh, the projects. Uh, again, you'd have to come in groups of two or three because I'd have to be making sure I'm not in violation of the Brown Act. Uh, but we could do those on, you know, we could try our best to accommodate people's schedules, but we would say, you know, like, on this day, we're gonna we have these three different time slots, um, and sign up or plug in people, and then we would just you know give tours on a, on a, on one day, or it could be over two days. It doesn't really matter to me, uh, but we could do it in a small in smaller group settings, um, and that could be at the wishes of the committee members. That meaning, so if some committee members think I I don't really want to visit the sites, I'm okay, um, that's great, and if some really want to, they have that opportunity. And my recommendation would be that we move. Shoot. Sorry, folks. My recommendation would be that we move forward with a regular meeting for July. Um, and Mike, why don't we move forward with your recommendation for uh, Brown Act compliant site visits? Okay. I, one thing for the new members, um, and this can be reevaluated, obviously, but the committee long ago decided that the entire committee would participate in the um, preparation of the annual report. Um, so it, it would be beneficial to go through that process. It would also be beneficial to go through a deep dive on the uh, financials uh, because we have a, at least Measure H has um, a very prescriptive, uh, prescriptively dictated uh, set of bylaws to the committee uh, created uh, by the board of um, trustees. Uh, one of those items is, uh, you know, there's three main items that we have on that, on the bylaws, one of which is informing the public. And to do that, we need to make sure we 
understand uh, the financial reporting process and mechanisms and how that all works together. Um, so that probably uh, in recognizing that we have three meetings left um, before a group of us go away, that probably should be the focus of next time. So unless anyone has an issue with that, that is probably in the interest of getting everybody up to speed um, more quickly, um, a path we should follow. And if we retroactively decide come September that everyone's on board and everything is going swimmingly, we can we can revisit site visits with with, with the uh, you know either the September or November meeting. Sounds sounds good, Kevin. Yeah. Any chance we can meet in person, Mike? Yeah. So a couple. So let me do just a couple things. So I appreciate Kevin for that clarity. So we'll have our staff still reach out to people. We'll select a, a date and see if people can you know we'll block our calendars off. So we'll try to make ourselves accessible to, to folks. Um, and then um, we'll probably, we'll, more than likely, we'll target it in July, maybe that same week or something to that effect, um, just because I know it's a, it, summer's going to be much easier for us to visit projects. And maybe, uh, Kelly, we can, uh, you know, we can look at the Napa Junction, American Canyon Middle School, and maybe even Donaldson Way, since it's right nearby, American Canyon Middle School, and we can show the modernization uh, work that was done there as well, too, um, uh, on that. And I lost track of what was the other thing I was going to say. What did you say, Richard? Meet in, meet in person? Oh, meet in person. So yeah, so the board, thank you for that. So the board will make some determinations of that uh, coming here in June. I don't see any reason why we won't, but this is, uh, we'll, we're gonna take our direction from the Board of Education. All the, all the, the board is meeting in, in person, uh, but none of the uh, subcommittees that we have uh, throughout the district are meeting in person yet. But I do believe that will change, but I will wait for direction from the board. And as soon as we know that, uh, we'll make sure and pass it along to the CBOC as well as other committees. Okay. And then Kevin, I'm going to okay. sign off here. Um, I need to join Dr. Mercedi, um, but okay. Kelly can text me if she needs me and I can jump back in if I, if I need to, if that's okay with okay. her. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great to see new okay. board members. Welcome aboard. Okay. With that, Kelly, let's jump back to uh, the financials and we'll just do a flyby on that real quick. Okay. All right, so this is really high level for our new members. Um, we often go into much more detail than this, but we did have kind of a special occasion having Dr. Massetti here talking about the potential bond and some other items. But I did want to give a quick update on where we are with Measure H. So um, you can see here, this is a breakdown of um, budget and expenditures for Fund 21, which is our bond fund. Um, you can see here that we have um, a little over 10 million um, remaining to spend. Some of that um, <clears throat> includes the remaining funding, which is unallocated. And for the new folks on the committee, the unallocated or remaining funding all the way to the right um, is basically like contingency. It can be used on any projects. You know, it started out... Um, larger when the program was larger and then it dwindles down as we get toward the end. Um, so if you have any questions on this, like, um, let me know, but it is called a cash flow snapshot because it is extremely high level. Again, for those who um, are new to the committee, Keystone is the financial software that we use um, here at NBUSD to manage the bond funds and other funds associated with facilities. The reason we have a special software just for that is so that we can track projects over multiple fiscal years. The district software is limited in that way because most of the things that we do um, at the district that is, are not associated with construction are cyclical. So things clear out each fiscal year. Um, what we wanna do with um, construction funds is track large projects over multiple fiscal years. So this system pulls down on a every two week basis from the district's financial software and then keeps a running tally, manages budgets and things like that. So this is the highest of the high levels we can get more granular all the way down to um, POs on specific projects at specific sites. 
Um, so that is a very quick rundown um, of where we're at and wanted to let the committee know where we're at as far as balance. Um, I will also point you to Fund 21's grand total of um, 274 plus million. That includes interest on the funds. Um, so they bear interest when they are with the county um, sitting in our accounts. Um, so that uh, accounts for the difference between the 269 and what you see here. Um, so if there's any questions, let me know. I have a question, Kelly. Is this is this snapshot on our available to us? Yes, so, it is. So I can look at weather. it in my in my leisure time. Absolutely. Um, it's uh, the slides that we're looking at right now are PDF and in your folder. Very good. Thank you. Just put them underneath your pillow. <laughs> I'll read it half time. <laughs> and Kelly, just one more time. This is through what date or as of what um, I believe it was May 1st, but if you give me one second, I'll check the date. Sorry, this one didn't print with the date as a, hold on one moment. So from a high level, right? 8.1 million remaining in the technology portion of Measure H, 2.2 million remaining in the non-technology portion, plus that or minus. That is correct. Right, so the non-technology mm -hmm. portion will be spent down by this time next year, right? Um, yes, the non-technology portion will be spent down pretty quick. And yes, I'm sorry, it is May 1st at, that this report is as of. Okay, and this is just to, again for the new committee members. This is, thank you. This is uh, Fund 21, which is Measure H. And at the next meeting, we'll talk about the other funds that are enabled as part of uh, Measure H, uh, such as school match, or um, what do you call it, Kelly? School matching um, state matching funds. So the district match, state matching funds. Yeah. Yeah. The district has other, um, you can almost think about them like checking accounts. Um, they have individual funds that house different types of money that can be spent on different things. So the bond is fund 21. All right. Any other questions on that folks? Okay. All right, Kelly, I'll leave it up to you if you want to crank through project updates or if we just want to punt and do that next time. Well, I'll do it. I'll just do it really fast. These are some pictures of our ongoing project at American Canyon Middle School. This is their new student commons, which is a multi-purpose room, library, and um, innovation center, which is basically just a large classroom that will enable presentations and large group projects and things like that. So here's a couple of pictures. You can see outdoor amphitheater. You can see a picture of the large multi-purpose room and a covered area where the students will be able to eat outside. Um, this is the innovation center on the left. Um, a little snapshot of the hood being put up in the kitchen for the multi-purpose room on the top right. And then a better photo of um, the overhang that's gonna be sort of like an indoor outdoor space where the students can sit and eat at lunchtime. Um, we made some small changes to the design since it was initially done, and this is an example of one of those. Um, the Innovation Center and the library are connected to one another. Um, at some, at um, some point, we kind of looked at the feasibility of this shared breakout space you see on the left that's kind of in the middle of the two rooms. And after talking with the site, we realized that what they really needed is some additional storage rather than that breakout space. Um, so we changed how the two spaces were connected and allowed for two storage closets to be installed to make sure that they have enough space for um, curriculum and books and things like that. Sorry, you guys, I'm going really fast, but <laughs> we'll get through it. Um, Another change that was made is um, there was a, um, an issue with, um, or a challenge I should say, with students crossing over where the field is. If you're familiar with the site, um, it's over here on the right. You can kind of see the corner of it um, in the rendering image. Um, they have to cross over to get to basketball courts, then there might be PE going while some other kids have lunch. So the site was very interested in putting in a basketball court in a more central location so that students on lunch can be in an area that's conducive to that and PE can be happening in a different area and kind of reduce the mixing of the students that are in different periods during the day. Um, so we are going to be doing a basketball court as part of the central cod as well. And then we're looking at some creative solutions for paint and making it kind of lively and fit in with the new theme of the campus. Um, we're also going to be providing uh, synthetic turf 
um, in the two areas um, on either side of the basketball court. And we will have stair-stepped amphitheater. So this is an additional amphitheater on top of the one that you saw in the last picture. Could you move your, oh, your mouse over to oh, where the back one? Yeah, if you could. Uh-huh. So could you move your mouse over to the original design to point where the update design was going? Oh yeah, sure. So this area here that you see that's just a big green rectangle of grass, we broke that up with what you see here with the blue arrows. So you can see here, there's the building, the corner of that building right here. And then here it is over there in the updated design. Okay. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, thank, that was okay. my guess, but I wasn't sure. Thank yeah, you. No, no problem. Um, all right, so in addition to that, um, we are also in the process of installing some smaller outdoor learning spaces that will go um, kind of like mini quads at um, three different locations at the site. Um, so you can see one of those is being installed um, right now, and you can see the rendering, the plan, and how it's coming together. Um, we also wanted to give a quick update on what's planned between now and the start of school in August. We'll be doing exterior paint um, for the entire campus. Um, we will be removing some aging portables that were underutilized and putting in all the new landscape that you saw on the last slide, and you can see the outdoor learning areas here. And then we'll be focused on moving students into all of the new spaces, library, um, innovation center, and the new multi-purpose room kitchen staff, getting those new picnic tables out and really getting the site all cleaned up. When we're done, we're hoping it really feels like almost like a whole new campus when you walk in. Um, we had an event recently where we invited students to come and do a beam signing. I know that we talked about it in a past meeting um, and it was a really fun and successful event. The campus was really excited. So this was a few months ago, you can see from the framing, but I just wanted to let you know, we had let you guys know that it was gonna happen and it did. All right, was that fast enough? <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer questions if there are any, I just didn't wanna eat up too much more of the meeting time. Good job, Kelly. All right, any questions from the committee on project updates? Each meeting we generally cover either geographical uh, specific project or um, product type specific projects. Okay. Um, so old business just quickly, 22 minutes over. Uh, we talked about site visits. Um, everything is on the website, uh, and that includes the annual report, Kelly Wright, from last week. Um, I, have not, I have not slid over the annual report yet, but I will do that before the end of the week. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. Okay. Any questions from anybody on accessing any uh, Measure H type documents or um, CBOC type documents? Okay. Um, with that, I think that's the last item on the agenda, correct, Kelly? Yep, we covered future agenda, and there you go. All right, and for new members, um, this is the first meeting we have run over in a very long time, as Kelly is my witness. True. And um, <laughs> so we generally are have been pretty good, uh, thanks to others, uh, keeping uh, to the hour and a half time frame. So apologies about today. And with that, thank you to the four of you that have joined. We really appreciate it. The district appreciates it. And um, come with your questions at the ready for our July meeting, which is on July. What's the date, Kelly? Oh, sorry. One second. 16th. There you go. 13th. Oh, 13th. Okay. There you go. Right. So it's always the second Wednesday of the month, unless it's otherwise noted. So, okay. Thank you all. Great. With that, it is 625, and we will call this meeting adjourned. Everyone have an excellent uh, rest of the week and a great weekend, and you'll be hearing back from uh, us just in terms of whether the meetings in per the next meeting is in person or uh, via Zoom. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Good night.